Give me three stanzas, first, second, and last, and then please stand.
So I guess we'll end the verses today. Amos chapter 7, verse number 7, and it reads as follows. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Let's pray before we look at today's verses. Dear God, thank you for your word, the Bible. Thank you for the people here today ready to worship you. Thank you for the people at home, you know, wanting to worship you. Lord, we ask your protection, your guidance through these trying times. Lord, we ask that you be with us all as we try to continue to hear your word no matter what. And you need to be strong in our faith no matter what. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So indeed, it is a trying time, right? A little bit, right? You know, unprecedented, as people would say. And look at numbers down the audience. It's a little bit different than what we're normally doing. But I think all of them went in detail last week already about how, you know, whatever happens, God's in control. And we have nothing to worry about, right? So that's why business as usual, into the Word of God. Looking at the book of Amos, we've been talking about Amos and judgment. Judgment is the theme of this book. When you talk about Amos, that's the thing that keeps on popping up over and over again. God's judgment. And now that we're going into the final three chapters of Amos, chapter 7, 8, 9, we're going to see several instances, the examples of judgment, and that will tell us something about God, and that will tell us some information that we need to know for ourselves. Last time, when we started off with chapter 7, with the first six verses, what we saw was two instances of judgment, right? The first was uh, grasshopper judgment. That was verse 1. A bunch of grasshoppers were going to come and ravage the land. And the second, in verse number 4, was a great fire, a fire that was going to devour up Israel you know, for all the sin, for all the judgment that it deserved. But in both circumstances, in the first two instances of judgment, we see this. We see Amos calling out to God, asking him to withhold judgment on Israel, saying, Israel is small, right? And in both cases, the Lord repents from his judgment. That's what we saw in verse number three. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be. There was no grasshopper judgment. Verse number 6. The Lord repented of this. This shall not be. There was no fire judgment on Israel. So we talked last time about this shows God's great mercy. We've been studying in the first six chapters of Amos the horrible sin of Israel. All the stuff they were doing wrong. All the reasons why judgment was deserved. Despite that, God withheld his judgment, our God's merciful God. And we know that's true even today. For all the sins that you do, I do, everyone does, we all have a chance still to get his good graces, to join him in heaven one day because of his mercy and his love for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so I talked about last time the importance of that mercy. Even in the Lord's Prayer, it says that we're supposed to forgive are our debtors, right? To forgive people. To show that same mercy to one another. Because we reflect God's mercy. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? We're telling people, as good evangelists, right? Come to God. Come to Jesus. He is merciful. He will forgive your sin. And instead of Listening to that, some people might look at you and say, hey, you're telling me you got to get God's mercy, but you yourself are not merciful. How can I trust that, right? Imagine one person, if they are always angry, unforgiving, mean-spirited. How does that reflect on us? How does it reflect on our Lord, Jesus Christ? If you're not merciful, how can your God be merciful? And we gave example 
like, you know, we get these horrible kids sometimes in like math camp or Chinese school, and they are bad, right? They're totally deserving of whatever comes to them. If they're in the regular school, they'd be expelled or kicked out or punished or whatever. But yet, in our circumstance, we can't do that, right? Why? We have to be merciful for them, because we want them to understand the love of Jesus Christ. And how can we say, God loves you, I will forgive you, at the same time saying, I'm going to kick you out of Chinese school and yell at you and make you cry, right? It doesn't make sense. Can't do it that way. So yes, so sometimes kids can get away with a lot more stuff in Chinese school and, uh, and math camp and stuff than they can in the regular school, because our goal is not, we're going to run the best school, our God is to show them the mercy of Jesus Christ and they get saved. But that was last time. This time, we have the second image of God's judgment. And he makes this image a plumb line, right? It says in verse 7, it says, He showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. So you guys ask, what's a plumb line? Let's see if I've got some chalk or whatever. Do my rudimentary drawings, if you guys don't know what a plumb line is. So man, you guys probably have seen it before, just don't know what it's called. So it's a tool, ancient tool, right? That looks like this. It's just a piece of string. <laughs> and on the bottom, there's a weight, whether it be a stone or a rock or whatever, right? That's all it is. It's a weight on a piece of string. And what do people do with the string? They put it next to a wall they're building, right? Because we know by the laws of gravity, when you put something like a string, Hanging down by weight, gravity will pull that string straight, right? So in the olden days, they didn't have a level. Today, we use like a level to see if your wall's straight, right? In the olden days, they put this uh, plumb line down. You look at it against the wall, and you say, "Aha, uh -huh, my wall's straight." Or maybe you screwed up, and your wall looks like this, and you go, "Uh oh, uh, I messed up," right? And you do it again. Your hope is that it looks like this. Oh, it's nice and straight. So God compares his judgment to this plumb line right here. This, this weight on the string. This thing that shows you whether or not it's straight. Right? It says in verse 8 that he will set a plumb line in the midst of his people Israel. Right? And he will not pass by them anymore. No more mercy. No more passing over no more giving the free passes. Now I'm going to look at them and I'm going to judge them like this. <coughs> and, judge stand, and, and God's standard is as objective as this plumb line, right? The plumb line never lies. There's no way to fool it, right? Gravity is gravity. It's going to be straight no matter what. Unless you like, what? Pull it left and right. Maybe you pull it left and right. Once you let go, what happens? He's going to go back to that same state. So God is like that when he talks about his judgment. This is it. This is the standard that I have for you guys, right? And what's going to happen when they fail the standard, verse 9, that the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste, and arise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So we know already from studying all these verses that Israel very much so failed the standard. They were not walking the straight and narrow path. They were walking the path of sinners. And... So it is that that judgment is coming for them. So what we see about judgment in these verses here is something quite simple, maybe something quite obvious, is that God's judgment is a fixed standard, right? It's a fixed standard. God made it quite clear what he likes, what he doesn't like, right? We have the whole law. We have the first uh, couple of books of the Bible. We see the whole law, right? It makes it clear. When it says something like, thou shalt not kill. Oh, that's pretty clear. You kill someone, you're not following the way he wants. He can evaluate that pretty clearly, right? If you're the killer, you're on the crooked path. You don't kill people, you're on the straight path, right? Your wall's looking good, right? The idea is that God wants us to strive for building up the straight way. You know, and it makes sense if you guys are builders or not builders like me, I'm not a builder. You know that when you when you have your whole house built on a sideways wall, that house is not gonna be stable, right? That house is gonna fall down if you're not careful enough, right? Likewise, 
our sin, our disobedience is a thing that's going to shake up our whole life. That's going to lead to all this judgment coming from God. That's the thing. That's the thing. You see, it was a problem for Israel back then because they couldn't see the standard so clearly. <clears throat> That's a problem for people today, too, I think. But the idea is this. People back then, as we saw from our study of the book of Amos, they decided, oh, you know, we know what God says, right? These are the children of Israel. Surely they've heard some of the stuff about what God says and God's law over the years. But their choice, their choice was that they want to do things their own way, right? They want to do their own way. They had their own idea. They weren't judging their lives against God's standard. They wanted to judge their lives against their own standard. And we saw this. For example, we read about in the verses prior, <coughs> in the prior chapters about their worship, for example. Oh, they knew they were supposed to go to the temple in Jerusalem, but they are lazy, so they made up their own side temples. And they said, ah, oh, that's okay. Right? That's okay. Right? When I do stuff like that, that's like saying, I'm going to use my own measurement now. I'm not using this straight plumb line. I want to use my own thing. My plumb line is one that looks like this, right? It's like zigzag and left and right. Oh, the idea is that it's whatever I want, right? It's supposed to be like this, but now I'm twisting it to make it fit the way I live my life so I can look at it and say it's okay, right? That's what the people way back in Israel's day did, right? That they said, oh, we're supposed to follow God's law, and he has all these commandments for us, but we're too lazy to do them, so we're going to edit it. We're going to change it. We're going to do it what's easy for me. And that's what they did. And you know, sadly, today, that's what happens to a lot of people too. That we slip up because we try to create our own standard for judgment, right? We're judging ourselves against the standard we make for ourselves. And it's no surprise that when we act as our own judge, we conclude we're always right. Makes sense, right? Because we're making the rule now, right? It's my rule, and I figure it's okay. This is what happens. A lot of people don't sin because they're like horrible, evil people, right? There's very few people, I think, in the world that are just like, I'm so evil, I want to go murder everyone, and so I'm the sinner, right? Most people are like you and me, where we say, oh, you know, yeah, I know what sin is. I know what's bad. I'm not going to do it. But you know what? We wind up doing it anyway, because in our mind, we make excuses. We make excuses. And that's how we wind up going the wrong way. Just like the people of Israel's day made up excuses. Go to Jerusalem, oh, it's too far. I'm making an excuse. So because it's so far, I can go to this other place and do my worship there and do a different type of worship and whatever, right? That's, uh, that's the way they did it. And that's the way people are doing it nowadays too, right? No one goes out there and says, yes, I'm a bank robber. I'm going to rob this bank and steal all the money. Now you guys do that. But are there times when our faith is tested by smaller instances related to something like stealing? Like some of you guys are tax people and accountants. You guys know this. It's not very hard to cheat on your taxes, is it? It's not very hard to just add a couple of uh, deductions here and there and you save like a couple thousand dollars. What are the odds you get audited? Less than 1% chance you get audited. If I all of a sudden wrote down that, yes, you know, I donated, you know, $10,000 to the Red Cross, they can check that. There's no way they can check that, right? That's a test for a lot of uh, people today. That some people feel like, oh, you know, boy, this is just a small thing. This is just a small adjustment on my tax return, for example. Let me just do it like that, and I can save a few bucks. Oops. That's stealing the same way going into the bank and robbing a bank is stealing, right? And getting money that is not justifiably yours, right? You thought it was one thing, but you fool yourself and think like, okay, it's okay. It's just one little thing. I'll switch it around, 
right? Switch it around, make it this way, it'll, it'll work out okay. That's the way people get tripped up, right? People know, people know, or supposed to know, right? Oh, you don't, for example, cheat on your wife or your husband, right? So why do so many people do it? You hear the excuses all the time, right? The excuses are something like this. Oh, I know that I married my wife, but you know what? My wife, she's a horrible person and she was mean to me, so this is my revenge for her. I'm justified in having the affair because she was so mean to me, she yelled at me, she did whatever. And in their mind, they change the scale of judgment. God's judgment is this. You don't have affairs. End of story. It's black and white. It's clear. These people in their mind, they make it this way. You don't have affairs. But in this situation, you can. Right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way for God. God looks at things so clearly. He sees things so clearly compared to us. Compared to us and our messed up minds that try to create justifications. That try to make excuses for sin. But those don't work. You know, it's so sad that even some churches fall into the same trap. That they want to go off and try to make their own standard to fit in with the world. Right? You know, there's some churches out there right now that have changed some of their stances. And they welcome, they welcome homosexuality. Even though... God pretty clearly says the same. They say, you know what? No, no, no. We're going to have gay weddings in our church. Gay people can become leaders in our church or whatever. No problem. You know why? And this is what they say. They say this. Stuff like this. They say, oh, you know, we know the Bible says homosexuality is the same. But you know what? If God were here today and he rewrote the Bible today, I bet you he would say love is love. And it's okay, and that's a, this is now the 21st century way of thinking, right? That that was in the old days, and it's different now. Folks, that's no different than making up the excuse of saying, I can cheat on my wife because she's mad at me. This is just a made-up, phony reason. Oh, God wrote something in the Bible, but he didn't mean that. That's the excuse these pastors are telling themselves when they perform the gay wedding or whatever, right? That's literally an excuse they're making. The Bible says it, but we don't need to listen to it because of this whatever twisted logic they get in their head. Folks, it happens over and over and over again. People make excuses. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you have the perfect judge, and that perfect judge is God. Just imagine a real life judge. They can, they can see through these things in an instant, instant, right? Imagine this. Imagine you got speeding tickets, right? Some of you guys got speeding tickets before, driving 70, 80 miles an hour on the freeway or something like that. And you go before the traffic commissioner, right? You go before the traffic commissioner, and the traffic commissioner says, okay, they've got you on the radar gun, here's a police officer. He said, you went 80 miles an hour, speed limit 65, you're guilty, right? Well, you can't just go to the judge and say this. You can't say like, oh, yeah, I drove 80 miles, but you know what? I was justified because I was late for work that day, and they should make an exception for me. I can break the law when I feel like it because I was late for work. I needed to drive fast. Judge, let me go. Is that going to work? Is any judge going to buy that excuse? No judge going to buy that excuse. They're going to be like, no, you're guilty. Can you go up to the judge and say this? Oh, you know, Judge, yes, I was driving 75 miles an hour on the freeway, speeding 65. But you know what? If the legislature were to look at it carefully, you know that 65 is way too slow on a speed limit because everyone drives 75. They would have changed the law to 75, right? They changed the law to 75. It should be 75. Therefore, I did not break the law at all. Judge, you got to let me go. Is he going to buy that? Judge's not going to buy that. Just the same way God isn't going to buy it when you say, oh, this is my standard. You've got to make an exception for me. Just like God's not going to buy it when you say, oh, the Bible says this, but I know, God, you would have rewritten the Bible to allow me to do this thing my way. Right, 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 right. Just let me go this time, right? God's not going to look at it that way either, right? He's going to say this. This is my standard. 
just like the traffic judge would say, 65 miles is 65 miles, you're over, you're guilty, right? Pay your ticket. God's going to say, hey, this is my standard here. You don't do this, you don't do that. I wrote in this whole Bible all the things I told you not to do, you're guilty. <coughs> That's it. And what's the result of being guilty? We read in these verses over here, verse 9, it talks about how the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, the sanctuaries of Israel to be laid waste, the house of Jeroboam will be risen against with the sword. <coughs> judgment. That's God's judgment. There's his punishment. He can see this, he can see what's right, what's wrong, and say, you're on the wrong side, there's a judgment coming for you. Right? Now, of course, people think this, and I'll have this last cycle, right? People think, well, how do I get out of this judgment, right? Because no one wants to get the judgment. It sounds horrible, right? It sounds horrible to have my place laid waste and uh, made desolate and attacked by the sword. And it's no different today, folks. Today, the same thing happens. When you go on the wrong side, there's a judgment coming for us, right? There's the same type of judgment. God knows what we do wrong. He's coming to judge us and judge our sins and the sins of the whole world. How do we get out of it? Right? Well, let's think back to the traffic court, right? So imagine, again, you're in the traffic court and now the judge says, your excuses don't make any sense. You are guilty and I'm going to render judgment. So what do you say next? Well, these are normal people. You start to say stuff like this, right? You say, oh, God, judge, your honor, I'm sorry, right? I'm really sorry, and I'll never do it again. Something like that, right? I'll never do it again. I'll never go speeding again, judge. You don't need to come. You don't need to give me a judgment. I'm so sorry. I'll be the best guy from now on, or whatever. And what the judge is going to say if you say that to him? He's going to be like, okay, good that you're sorry, but you still broke the law, right? So what? I still got to do judgment. That's the way justice works, right? You do the crime, you do the time, right? The old saying. And likewise, when we come to God, it's not enough for us just to say like, oh God, I sinned. Sorry. Oops. Right? What do we need instead? What do we need instead? How do we get on God's right side? Well, it's the same way you get on the right side of that judge in the traffic court. There is one, because there is one way the judge will let you off free. Right? Maybe this will make sense to you guys, right? You go before the judge, the judge says you're guilty, and uh, now you got to pay your speeding ticket. It's like 500 bucks. But he lets you go free. Why? He'll let you go free because someone else paid the speeding ticket for you. As long as you get pay the $500, he doesn't care. Right? Oh, someone paid $500. You can go free now. I don't care anymore. The judge says, you're done. You're gone. Have a good day. We got the 500 bucks, right? Likewise, the judgment for sin, the judgment that Israel is hoping to avoid, the judgment we're hoping to avoid, can be avoided if we have someone else pay the fine. And we all know who that someone else was that paid the fine for us. That person was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saw us before John the judge, and here's God about to render judgment on us. He's looking at us, saying, you guys sin. You can make all the excuses you want. You can say, I'm sorry, all you want. Sin is sin. I am the God of justice. This is my standard. As straight as the plumb line. That's my standard. Jesus looks up and says, you know what, God? I'll take the punishment. I'll take the judgment instead. I'll satisfy anything that's wrong. And he did that for us. And that's why we need Jesus. Right? It's not enough to say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Right? And we teach all the, the young ones and the witness. It's not just, God, I'm sorry for my sins. It's, God, I'm sorry for my sins. And I need Jesus Christ take the punishment for me. In Jesus. It's Jesus Christ where we get true redemption. And when God was calling his people, 
effective, even in the days of Amos. It was a calling back, not just of, oh, to say I'm sorry. It's a calling back to God, to worship God, to worship his coming Messiah, the Jesus that they didn't even know yet, that was going to be born, to worship him in the right way. So again here we see this third, this is now the third, the third image of judgment, third image of judgment, which is the plumb line. God's solid, unmovable, unchanging standard that we all fail to meet, but thankfully we have Jesus to help us get by that uh, problem. All right, our time's up here. Let's bow forward to prayer and move on the rest of the images of judgment next time. Dear God, thank you for your word of the Bible. Thank you that we have Jesus to forgive us for all of our sins. Lord, we're so thankful that we have Jesus Christ that came to find for us. We know that your standard is tough. Your standard is unmovable. People try to fool ourselves into thinking, this is a different way we can do it. We can get away with it. But no, we cannot. Lord, we can only trust in you. Lord, we can only find salvation in you. Hopefully everyone here in this audience has found salvation in you. Lord, continue to be with us this Sunday. Keep us safe. Keep us strong. And we continue to worship you and honor you in all ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I believe we're going to meet up in the main auditorium to give us more distance from each other So, in the second half. All right?